As you can see, there are three guys here. It's Benny, it's Ruben, and it's well, Sean as well. Sean is sitting here. Yeah. He, he, he moved well, a couple of weeks ago to the other side, to the dark side. The dark side. The dark side. He works for VMware now. <laughs> so, uh, it's a big loss for the community, so to say. Yeah. Good, for you. Uh, good for us, because now we get all the interesting conversations that we always wanted to have with a vendor like VMware yeah. through Sean, which is great. So it's Team RTE, Team Remote Graphics Experts, and our goal is to share the information around graphics with the community through well, presentations like this, blog articles, videos, white papers, books, and all that kind of these kind of things. So that's that's Team RTE. As Benny mentioned, the first topic is VDY. Why? Why desktop virtualization? Why virtual desktop infrastructure? Well, there are there are a couple of reasons, and I wrote down eight of different eight different reasons. First of all, it's access from anywhere. Access your applications and desktops, Windows applications and Windows desktops from anywhere. Where work is not a place. That applies to me. For me, work is not a place. I travel 12, 13 times a year uh, outside Netherlands, so work for me is not a place at all. And I get my things done with VDI and other concepts to get, uh, get things done. Why does virtualization also have a high performance workspace? We can deliver a really high performance workspace. Many will We'll cover that. I will cover that also from uh, from a different angle. So we can create a high performance workspace, which is running in a data center and remote to any device. Security control protects your intellectual property. Is another reason for graphics for virtual desktops for VDI in this uh, this scenario. Data is centralized. I'm doing a couple of projects right now with really large data sets, terabytes of data sets. So execution, workspace, workstation, and data is centralized, are sitting, sitting next to each other. Sometimes in 10 gig network kinetic connection side by side. So data sets is, uh, is centralized and there's no, no need for syncing large data sets. Well, supporting bring your own or corporate owned personally enabled scenarios is part of that story. Reducing costs, well, that is an interesting one. It's not, from my perspective or our perspective, not always easy to calculate Use VDI and you will save X amount of money. Because that's really tough to make that calculation. And one of our other community friends, Brian Madden, wrote an interesting blog post, I think, four or five years ago, how to lie, how, how vendors, sorry Sean, how vendors lie with cost calculators in their advantage. So you, you'll, get, you'll get a point with TCO and ROI calculators. So reduce cost is part of the story, but you need, it, you need to take it with a grain of, uh, of salt. And ergonomics is part of the VDI questions. I see that quite often in, the, in training environments with a lot of uh, workstations and multiple screens, and people want to get rid of that. Simple thin clients or zero clients on the desk, and all the intelligences in, in the data center. We've done an, uh, an interesting survey with VRC, Project Virtual Reality Check, and the response on the question why do you why are you interested in desktop virtualization? It's pretty simple. A lot of people are interested because of centralized management, support flex working, also supports power users with 3D graphics and storage solutions in place, and supports remote locations. Work is not a place. These are the key components in that, uh, that scenario. Another interesting question is, what type of hypervisor is being used in your VDI scenario? And you can clearly see that a lot of people are using vSphere 5.0, 5.1, 5.5. Some people, 10, 11% almost, are using Zen Server. The unique of Zen Server today is vGPU support, Benny will cover that. And well, some people are using Hyper-V, but the majority of people running VDI are using vSphere for that. The other question is interesting, what's the next platform for the, what's the, platform for the next, next couple of years? So that's the question we'll cover here. So, will you introduce or change a different hypervisor vendor within two to three years? 845 people filled in and completed this survey. And a lot, almost 60% is happy with the current platform. But 30% is investigating or seriously consider Microsoft. And really a small percentage of people is considering Zen Server. My perspective, our perspective is that when VMware enters this game with vGPU support, that is the nail in the coven of Zen Server in the enterprise. 
So there will be use case for Zen server for sure, or Zen server in, in cloud scenario for sure. But when VMware enters this game with vGPU support, I think that will, will shift gears from a Zen server perspective. Use case as well. We do both projects, BQ, QQR, and a lot of people in the audience as well. Uh, what I see is constructing and engineering. I do a couple of projects right now in that area. One project in aerospace, in Holland, there's, there's a company called Fokker. They uh, can help the name in, uh, in English, but it's, <laughs> it's a Dutch <desk> name. <laughs> uh, medical, you, you have a couple of cases with the uh, medical environments. Yeah, there are a couple of cases right now, and uh, what they want to do is they want to do re uh, surgery planning uh, for uh, cancer uh, treatment. And they have inner accelerators, and they want to do this planning uh, using remoting. And this is really challenging. So that's, that's an SD VD session. Now I'll shift gears to VD Cry. Why VD Cry? Because we are doing projects. We see the opposite as well. Not only the vendor part portion, this is awesome, this is great. But we need to implement stuff. And VD Cry is more like be aware of. And we are in this space for, I'm in this space for, I think 17, 18 years, started with WinFrame. So this list. It's the same list from my simple perspective as well, 17 years ago. Time has changed because well, there's another de there's a demand for other applications, but the essence is the same. What is the end user experience? And what is his perception of experience? Perception is about communication and managing expectations. Do you meet the expectations the end user or business consumer has when you deliver applications or desktops as a service? What is the end user experience when you look at the whole stack and what is, well, what is influencing that experience? There are, there are a lot of chains, a lot of connections in a bigger, a bigger chain which could influence the end user experience. Could be endpoint, could be networking, could be uh, how you develop, how, how do you use best practices in, in VDI. A lot of things can, can influence the end user experience. Be aware of it. Really focus time on end user experience. Focus time. Spend time and write, use the right solution with end-to-end -end performance monitoring. The impact of networking, how much bandwidth do I need? That these type of questions will pop up always. The answer is it depends what you do, how many monitors you're using. 4K, uh, 60 frames per second, 30 frames per second, uh, what type of application, how many movement, compression, no compression. Or you, can, you can make a large list of topics which will influence the impact on networking. So the answer is not simple, that's the essence. Complexity of the overall technology stack. With hyperconvergence, for instance, that is getting smaller, but still it's a pretty, well, pretty large list of things which could, well, which could implement, which could uh, influence the end user experience. From endpoint to virtual machine, and from virtual machine to other information sources in the data center. That whole list is the solution for the end user. Understand the whole stack, whole stack, and have people on board who can do a deep dive when there are performance problems. And at last is licensing. Licensing in general, licensing with bring your own device is challenging, Microsoft licensing is challenging as well. Try to understand licensing is a big challenge. And therefore we spent a couple of days in creating a license flowchart. If we want to share the flowchart, some people have seen the flowchart and others doesn't, other people don't have seen the, the flowchart, so we will share it. This is the flowchart we came up with to explain Microsoft licensing in a VDI scenario. This makes complete sense. So, give it a try. Use this flowchart to explain it to your manager or to, uh, to, uh, to other people about Microsoft licensing. Until then, <laughs> you can use this, uh, this chart as well. Still, it's not that easy. Understand licensing and VDI, and especially licensing in a bring your own scenario, is really, really challenging. You'll get the deck, you can download the deck, or when you're really in a hurry, you can uh, get a copy of the deck uh, after the session. And so uh, you can easily see this, uh, this. That's the easiest way to describe Microsoft yeah. licensing. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yes, that's it. I covered five topics around VD Cry. Well, there's a big topic around VD Cry called storage. In the early days of VDI, there was a challenge to understand what is the challenge around uh, read write ratio, about the rate penalty, about latency about uh, rate levels, all these kind of things. Right now, the biggest challenge is 
which Venom do I use out of the 100 in the booth, in the exhibition hall? Because there's a, this is a big market. VMware's in the space, Citrix is in the, is in the storage space, uh, Nutanix, there's a, there are a lot of vendors in this space. What is the right solution for that? That is a challenge, that's a tension right now in, in VDI. We can talk for two hours around storage of VDI. That's a different, completely different uh, presentation. But understanding storage in VDI, and especially the graphics in VDI, is a really important uh, attention point. Shift gears a little bit and, and explain a little bit about graphics for virtual desktops. Because there are a lot of choices, Benny will explain a lot of concepts. What is the right choice? How do you, well, how do you go from VDI cry to well, a, a real good solution? And the first step is focus on me. Me is not Ruben living in the Netherlands, three kids, blah, 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 blah. But me is the business consumer. A different word for end user. The business consumer has certain demands to get things done. Understand what, their, what his or her demands are. And translate that to a strategy plan. That is the starting point of solving VDCry and solving workspace in general. So understanding user scenarios, task workers, knowledge workers, power users, what is their demand from a graphics perspective, and which concepts, as Benny will explain, fit and solve these, well, fill in these demands. That is a very important uh, thing. Liquid Wear Labs, for instance, is a solution to, uh, to find out how applications behave from a resource perspective, what users are, are doing with applications. So that could be a helpful solution to well, just investigate what the user behavior, behavior with applications is. So next topic is understanding 3D graphics concepts. I think that's an important one, and then Benny will explain it. Yep. But, so I will dive into these uh, 3D graphics concepts or accelerated concepts. So this is the overview, and uh, well, you have this bare metal model where you just install either a server or a Windows client system on a physical box and you remote into it. You're using a remoting protocol. Typically, if it's Microsoft only, you're using RDP, you remote into it, and uh, that is one of the things, or you're using it locally. You're not remoting. You're just using it as a workstation with a physical GPU. So these are the things that you can do when I'm talking about bare metal and direct map. The next thing is, I remote into the machine, but I'm not taking advantage of, of uh, graphics hardware. So that means the software that emulates a GPU runs on the CPU, meaning the CPU pretends that, is, that it is a GPU. That is the idea of software graphics. It makes it easier for the developers of the systems to apply the same algorithms as if there was a GPU, a physical GPU. So they just say there is some sort of a GPU, either it's emulated or it's physically available. Now, if it's not physically available, it's emulated, and this is what we refer to as software graphics. The next thing is a shared GPU, a pass-through GPU, and a GPU virtualization. Those are the three concepts that I will highlight in just a minute. Because those are the important things when you do remoting and you're using physical GPU resources that sit in your server. If we look at the direct map, the bare metal, we can use like all the remoting protocols and solutions out there. Microsoft, Citrix, VMware. And the underlying hypervisors from, from each of these vendors. Also, very simple idea. What you see there are virtual drivers, synthetic drivers that live in the virtual machines. So it's not native drivers for any of the graphics or the uh, network card or the hard disk. Those are virtual drivers. So this is very important for the next things that I will explain. So now we have the shared GPU or the API intercept. So you see, it's remote effects and PC over IP. So uh, it's a Microsoft or a VMware solution, uh, which means that you install those virtual drivers, um, the synthetic drivers that come with your, with your uh, integration uh, tools in the VM. Now, if your application makes an API call that is a graphics API call, 
it's intercepted by this driver and it's forwarded to the physical graphics card. This is something that I call unmanaged or uncontrolled shared GPU because you start adding more VMs and they all have access to the same physical hardware. There's nothing that controls how many resources are dedicated to each VM. So if you start adding VMs, you degrade the performance that you will see on each of the individual VMs, even though there's hardware involved. So um, this is what uh, Microsoft does with um, their implementation they call RemoteFX vGPU. And it's done with uh, VSGA from the VMware side. So Microsoft calls it vGPU. But oh, that's very confusing. This is why I, why I said RemoteFX vGPU, because later we will see a solution that is called Grid vGPU. Be very careful with those two. This is remote effects and it says that it's a couple of hundred frames per second. Do not trust frames per second. Because frames per second don't tell you anything. What arrives at the client and what the user experience, the perceived user experience really is. Do not believe frames per second. <laughs> Just believe what is better. So, same, same situation. Now we look at dedicated pass-through GPU doing a Google Earth um, scenario. And here you see that uh, VMware is consuming about three times the bandwidth that uh, Citrix does. Um, I mean, still, the performance on the Citrix side is amazing. You see more artifacts, more compression artifacts on the Citrix side. Uh, so you see that, that the two vendors are highlighting different things. Citrix tries to reduce the bandwidth as much as possible, while VMware, PC over IP, Teradici, they are trying to, to uh, create the best performance and do not care so much about the bandwidth that is required. So it's two different sides of the metal. What else? Yeah, doing the same comparison again. And the same thing, we use more bandwidth on the, uh, on the VMware side as we do on the Citrix side. However, these dedicated things, they, they really work smoothly. Uh, I'm always impressed how good they work. It's, it's, it's amazing. About a year ago, for the first time, we were able to beat a local installation by remoting into a high-end graphics uh, uh, VDI environment, uh, which is amazing. Okay, the final thing that I want to show you, NVIDIA Grid vGPU running on top of VMware. And uh, again, starting with the Google Earth example, now it is the entire spectrum. So you see software, upper left, you see um, the shared GPU, upper right, you see the direct GPU axis, lower left, and you see the vGPU, so the managed shared on the lower right. Here you see a staggering of the software, but the others perform quite well. Now let's make it a little bit more resource intensive. So here you see these things that I mentioned before with the frame rate. Even though those two are using the exact same hardware, it's only one session, but you see there's a difference in the frame number. It seems to be a, a stable frame number in the vGPU on the vGPU side, while pass-through is, yeah, it says it renders 800 frames per second, even though the perceived performance is the same. You see that the, the, the software GP, uh, the software uh, rendering completely degrades. This thing that you've seen before, moving fast forward. And for a while, the uh, shared GPU keeps up with the pass-through GPU, but then it starts staggering like the uh, software GPU, the software rendering does. So again, uh, superior performance in the two lower uh, videos. 
Here's again one of those where it does not work for uh, software and for shared, uncontrolled shared, while it works for controlled shared and pass through. So that is one of the things that we're seeing, pretty much the same performance. And the last one is a fairly high end uh, DX10 application. And it's exactly the same behavior. So it will not work on the software uh, render. It will not work on the uh, on the shared GPU. It will only work with the uh, direct GPU and with the um, eGPU. Okay, that gives you an impression. And I got to hand it over to Ruben again. It's really awesome to see that VMware is entering this game. As I started with the uh, with the survey information, a lot of people, a lot of my clients, are really interested in uh, in VMware vGPU support. So we'll see early. We will see next year when uh, when vGPU will uh, will be shipped inside uh, inside vSphere. So one of the questions we see often: Okay, what is the right solution? Many explain the different concepts. Oh, hopefully, and I'm pretty sure about that that you understand the different concepts better. So what is the right solution? Well, it depends on the question you have. Are you looking for a high performance scenario? Or is API support and application certification, is that really important? Well, I'm from Holland, so it's always about, okay, what is cost? Is that, is that important as well? So what's, what is driving the, 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 the questions? So performance, application support cost, and depending on well, these questions, you can clearly find the answers on it. That's why we created this, uh, this overview. Third topic is overview of Graphics for virtual desktop solutions and some pros and cons. So when we look at the landscape of, uh, of today, today around graphics for virtual desktops, you see quite some logos. Logos is just my graphical imagination where to where to well, where to place logos. It has nothing to do with magic quadrants or or these type of things. You can see that AMD, Nvidia, and Intel these are the three well, GPU vendors of today. As ben, Benny mentioned today, NVIDIA has, is the only solution which is able to have VGPU support with GRID. Probably over time, AMD will, uh, will enter this game. We'll see on a longer time what Intel, what Intel will, uh, will do. So right now, NVIDIA is dominating the uh, VGPU space. From more a remoting protocol perspective, it's HP, it's Teradici. Dell with Quest V workspace in some degree, Citrix, VMware, Microsoft, Nice, NVIDIA as well. They all have their remoting protocols. Also, NVIDIA has a remoting protocol called Grid, grid, grid Streaming Protocol. What customers start asking us is Microsoft only solutions, yeah. which is, well, interesting on one side because the product are lots of matures. So now with Windows 10, they also support OpenGL and all that kind of stuff. So, so they're, they're getting closer. To, to the leaders of the market, which are VMware and Citrix. Uh, but on the other side, management really sucks. it be very clear. It's extremely hard to manage a Microsoft-only environment on a daily basis. So and this is, not, this is not the, the common because we are on, on, no, no, on no, VMware. No, no, we will say no, no. in two weeks at TechEd. We're going to be at TechEd and we're going to tell Microsoft exactly the same thing because I'm going through projects right now and I tell you, it's painful. So from the VDI perspective, this space is dominated by Citrix and VMware. So VDI solution, Citrix and VMware. Then a little bit of Microsoft, a more and more demand for Microsoft. Then it's nothing, nothing, and then some discussion about Quest and some other smaller plays. That is that's what I see in within my environment and when I talk to uh, to peers in the in the community. Then you have Amazon and Otoy and Mainframe as well, solutions running on Amazon, delivering applications for desktops as a service. So leveraging Amazon EC2 and grid instance or GPU instances on Amazon and adding well, Rover and remote uh, protocol functionality to, to that platform. We don't see these three that often uh, in, in, in our scenarios. We are more focused on, on enterprise scenarios. But it's, it's, part of the, it's part of the game and part of the solution stack. Interesting to see that HP and NICE, for instance, they play well in Scenarios where you have demand for Linux guest OS support. So not Linux endpoint support, but guest OS support. So there are scenarios as well. So 
So which product is the best? That's the question I get quite often. I wrote uh, the white paper called the uh, Smackdown, together with uh, Benny and Sean, we wrote a white paper for 3D graphics for Fortress and Smackdown. So Smackdown is like a battle between two snails, two cars, two components, whatever. So which is the which product is the best? Well, it depends what type of concept you're looking for. Many explain the concept. So what these are the vendors, and these vendors support software graphics, bare metal, password support, GPU visualization, API intercept, uh, GPU sharing for uh, for uh, Zeta. Now please know that before you order something. So this is what I said earlier. But to make easy decisions and to answer this question without any well, uh, consulting uh, skills of, uh, of us, you can answer your quest this question yourself. And it's pretty simple, because what you can do is use my one euro coin or a dime when you're uh, when you in the US. That's fine as well. And just flip the coin and make a decision. This is VMware and this is Citrix. So let's see what it was. <laughs> Citrix. <laughs> so Citrix is the best solution. That's well. That's pretty clear the answer here. So when you have no clue about requirements and you don't spend any time about requirements and investigating requirements with a business consumer, just flip the coin. That's the most easiest way to make a decision. It's a very stupid way of making a decision. Obvious, but you get the point. I've seen this. I've done this trick three times in different workshops at customer sites. And well, these guys will think, well, he's from Holland, I understand, but what did he smoke yesterday or what did he drink yesterday? <laughs> this doesn't sound good. And then I understand, okay, when you have no clue about requirements, and you don't agree on requirements, you don't you, can, you, you cannot proceed in the in the project. So to help with well, qualifying questions to, to make the right decision for for solutions, this information is probably helpful. So these are some qualifying questions, and we wrote down more qualifying questions in the, um, yeah. the 3D graphics for SmackDown book. We have a couple of them. So when you have questions afterwards, yeah. uh, we can trade. You have a question, you get a book. Because it's, it's, it's not the idea to, to dive into each individual of these questions, because you can read those questions, and, and it's very obvious what they mean. Yes. Uh, but you better ask those questions in order to make a smart decision. And uh, as Ruben pointed out, it's in this white paper. You can either download the white paper or you can just get the book. And, yep. and especially like a support for vGPU password shared, different vendors have different options, obvious. And investigating the vendors is important, but to start with, okay, what is the functional requirement? What do you need? Is it high performance? Is it API support? Is it application certification? Is that important? Other qualifying questions, okay, what is the customer base? That is, is it a small or medium enterprise? With 10 users, well, that will drive probably a completely different solution. That will, then a different solution could be uh, more interesting than like an enterprise focused solution. Uh, are you interested in, well, in, are you an ISV? Are you a software vendor? Maybe Amazon with mainframe can be a scenario. Are you an enterprise? Then probably Citrix or VMware is, uh, is, is a very uh, compelling scenario. Does the solution work well in LAN when wireless mobile scenarios? And what does these scenarios mean from a latency? perspective for instance. And especially above 150 milliseconds, yeah. you get into, well, into the discussion, okay, does it meet the requirements, does it meet the perceived performance or the real performance? It's good from my perspective that VMware bought Framework, I think uh, almost a year ago, right? And incorporated that solution uh, in, in their stack because that will drive, especially in the mobile and really when scenarios, where bandwidth is not a ch the challenge, but uh, latency, and back is a challenge, that will be an interesting solution. And we'll see what VMware's response will be in that scenario. It's important to understand what is the API support. Many, many mentioned that a couple of times. API support like DirectX, like OpenGL, like OpenCL, like CUDA support. What does the application need to get up and running? And match that with the different vendors. Understanding applications, I've already mentioned Lakeside, and Liquid Labs is also another player. These uh, vendors can be helpful in investigating what applications are using, also from the API perspective. These are only the product calls that, or the, the scenarios that are available today. Now, you can add the vGPU support uh, for, for vSphere now, and uh, the view, and that will look pretty much the same way as the uh, 
GPU support is for the Citrix world. So it's pretty much the same technology that, that is being used there. And uh, as I said before, Windows 10 is also a game changer because suddenly Microsoft officially supports um, OpenGL as well because they were very weak on the OpenGL side. But now they go in the combination of the two tech previews, the, the server and uh, Windows client tech preview. I did this testing last weekend and they really support uh, all DirectX scenarios that we have and most of the OpenGL scenarios that we have. And that makes it very strong. So, they are all going in the same direction. So the heat is on. That's a good thing, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. More choice. So, some, some notes from the field. And prior to, when, when Sean, well, before Sean uh, joined VMware, we had some interesting conversations about notes from the field. He did uh, implementations in, with his clients. He did implementations in his own lab. Uh, when did, uh, did some stuff, I did some stuff. It was in the early days, like early this year. And we just want to share some uh, some thoughts about yeah. about the things we've seen. Well, performance obviously is not only about GPU. It's a combination of a couple of things. It's about storage, high performance storage. Could be flash, could be local flash, could be appliance, could be uh, could be software, uh, CPUs, cores, clock speed of CPUs. I'm running a couple of projects right now where just a couple of stupid applications, Altus Graphics is one of them. It's not really consuming GPU. It is consuming CPU, and this customer prefers a six-year-old, six gigahertz Pentium 2 compared to like a, a 12 or a 20-core uh, two gigahertz CPU, because CPU clock speed is much is really important for that old-school application. So performance is a combination of things: CPU on different sides, storage on different sides, uh, GPU profiles on different sides. Understanding network impact, as I mentioned in the VD Cry section, is really important. We've seen that over time, where people have different expectations and think, well, we can use, uh, we, we, we just need 200 kilobytes for this. Uh, this yeah, that's a myth, and uh, that's just not true. This is why I showed you this initial uh, video uh, that, that clearly uh, was indicating that the remote protocols take all the bandwidth they get if they have access to it. Yep. So they easily take 40, 50, 60 uh, megabit per second if they have that bandwidth available. And, and so if you do some testing within uh, your lab environment and you have your, your high speed network and it's only one session that you're running there, please take a look at the network, what's going on there. Because then later if you have a production environment, you do not have 50 megabit per user available. Maybe your users have it when they connect from the client side, but most probably you will not have it on the server side in their data center if you're hosting the VMs or the sessions for hundreds or thousands of users. And that's going to be the bottleneck. What kind of gear do you use for measuring the... Uh, for measuring, uh, I'm using a posit, um, uh, an appliance. I have two appliances. One is mobile and one is uh, uh, a 90 inch uh, rack. Uh, device and it allows me to emulate all the different network conditions so uh, I can well sort of make sure that the bandwidth is only 8 megabit as, as uh, you've seen before and I can introduce a 50 or 200 millisecond latency I can introduce packet loss so uh, because I want to simulate uh, access to a cloud and to a public cloud, which typically includes uh, packet loss that is significantly higher than if you're doing the same thing on a local network. So instead of only having a fraction of a percent of packet loss, you certainly may have one or two or even five percent uh, packet loss, which definitely influences the performance. You have software components like uh, uh, WAN AM, for instance. Yeah. Um, this, this like mobile box, like three, four hundred euros. Is not that the small, the small one is, is not so expensive. The big one, that's a really expensive one because it allows me to go to customers and record what they do, what their network does, and reproduce it in the lab. So it can sort of track for twenty four hours what the network conditions at a customer site were, and s store that, and I can reproduce it in the lab and, and use that setup again and again, which is very handy sometimes. But it makes that a very uh, Several thousand uh, dollar uh, machine or box. Well, benchmarking is not equal to production. We do benchmarking a lot. 
I've shown them many as well, they show like 4,000 4, videos. Yeah, it's between 4 and 5,000 videos. Within Project VFC, we have done benchmarking for the last six years. And almost on a weekly basis, my co workers or potential customers or customers, they will refer to this by way. Well, in this scenario, you will have like 123 users on this box. So we calculated with 123 users in our environment. And now it doesn't work. It fails. And this is not a joke, this is real what, 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 what's happening quite often. So production environments and benchmarking are two different things. Benchmarking is very handy to find best practices, or to, uh, to evaluate solutions. And check the underlying hardware, both the server and the GPUs and the CPUs and everything, if it's compatible. Please do not purchase a server, even if you go to HP, Dell, or any of those, and you randomly purchase a server, and then you decide you want to use vGPU, if it's not on the comp compatibility list, it's not going to work. And there's nothing that can help you to fix it. And it's even handy to just ship the server and GPU in one, in yeah. one swipe, yeah. instead of just buying the server and three months later buy the GPUs with an expansion kit. We have serious challenges in finding the right expansions. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, I'm, I'm running some Cisco here and it took me a couple of weeks. Last, I didn't, didn't explain that, I didn't uh, tell many about this example. Last week, one of my comp biggest competitors phoned me and was like, do you have this special power cable for the Cisco C240 M3? And the answer was yes. I'm really I really want to use that cable for two weeks. I have a POC up and running. I'm trying to get hands on that specific cable for six weeks. I called everyone in the industry. Yeah. I couldn't yeah. find that cable. And I have a cable of, of earlier tests I've done. So I helped him. That's, that's how it works. And make sure that the BIOS is good. It's... Oh, man. <laughs> so these, are, these are the little things that really, that really can hurt you. We can, we can write a couple of blogs oh, yeah, yeah. about our notes from the field in this space. So. This leading graphics application, make sure that they support that particular remoting scenario because there are popular, very big vendors that are not into that kind of technology yet. Yep. So uh, they need more pressure from the market. Uh, understand what the limitations are on the client side as well. <laughs> because sometimes the client can be too weak. So that's another thing that we find if, if customers already, again, purchase some client and uh, it just doesn't work. And please uh, look at performance tuning. So there are tricks for each of the different vendors. And, uh, and these are written down as well. Yeah. The, so uh, so. pinning CPU, uh, CPU sockets to, avert it to certain VMs will increase the, uh, the performance for instance. So, we come to the end. Starting with VDGRI, VDY, uh, graphic concepts, uh, vendors and overview, uh, pros and cons, uh, some uh, Qualifying questions and notes from the fields. I hope, well, we hope it's a, it's a really comprehensive set of information. And um, well, we have just one small thing, right? I have my hands. <laughs> so we have a couple of books, uh, 3D graphics. You can have a, a digital version as well. Uh, just well, uh, send us an email, uh, team at teamrte.com, or just grab a business card, it's fine. Yep. We have a question, just, just let me know, and you'll get a book. We don't have a question, I really want to book. If you have a good question, you get a book. Oh, here's the first question. If you want to leave, that's fine for those who want to leave. At that point, we want to say thank you, yep. but please stay here and ask the question if you want to have a book. <laughs> so, yeah, you described the server side of the problem, and uh, I have a question about the client side of the problem. Do you have such a comparison table for different type of the clients? their operating systems and uh, their ability to perform uh, the graphics at the needed way. Because uh, as far as I see in my own experience, uh, for example, Intel Core i5 uh, graphics is the best one, but the difference and the comparison of uh, Teradici zero clients, uh, Intel i5. Give him 10 bucks, man. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we don't have the answer because we did not do any of those comparisons. About two years ago, we oh, this did year, this the year. mobile, the yeah. mobile uh, comparison of the mobile clients. So Sean bought all the mobile clients he was able to get in the market. That was an interesting conversation with your wife, I guess. 
And uh, so uh, we did a lot of testing around those, but these were rather uh, looking at the 3G and 4G uh, networks and not looking at what you're asking for. But, but also, on a thin client perspective, uh, there's, there's called like an almost thin client smackdown. Uh, you with uh, uh, Andy did that at Rifle. Ah, yeah. So That's hook up with, well, with, with Sean or with us <laughs> and get access to that Viper because it will give you some guidance about okay, what is the right endpoints in this type of scenario. And are there any papers or any uh, investigations uh, open in the network uh, on this problem? Not yet. Yeah. And can, uh, yeah. even can you place the types of the client according to their productivity? Yeah. So can you say that, for example, in all scenarios, Linux clients are more um, before performance than... That would be a complete 